The predictive screening platform is a fast and effective way of finding predictive variables within your data. The simplicity of the predictive screening platform hides its true power. I'm going to show you how to use it and what traps to avoid, and I'm going to give you an explanation of what's going on under the bonnet. To illustrate the predictive screening platform, I'm going to work with these tablet data. So I have a, a row that represents a batch, and that batch either passes or fails. And the pass or fail is being determined based on this dissolution characteristic. So if the value is above 70, we pass. If it's below 70, we fail. Okay, now what I want to understand is why these batches are failing. And to do that, the first thing I really need to do is identify a potential list of predictor variables. And the variables I have available to me correspond to different steps of the manufacturing process and also some information about raw materials. In total, I have 17 parameters and I want to identify which are the most important ones with respect to this pass fail outcome. I'm going to do that using the predictor screening platform. First of all, I just want to show you the results of the platform. So let me just run the script. And this is what I get. I just get a, a tabulation which shows me, if you think of this bar chart here, it's like a Pareto plot. So you can see that spray rate is the largest effect. Then I have medium effects for screen size and mill time. And then I would say I've got low effects for exhaust temperature and inlet temperature. And as we come down, we get to negligible effects down here. So it gives me a relative ranking. So if I wanted to pick out a top three, I can say it's the spray rate, the screen size and the mill time. If I want to go further, I can say then I've got the inlet and exhaust temperatures. So this is a particularly powerful way of identifying the important few, and it's very easy to do. So let me show you how you run the, this platform. From the analyze menu, I can come to screening and select predictor screening. Let me just put this one to the left because I just want to compare the results. So I choose the outcome as the response and then all of my potential parameters as the X's and then click OK. And that's it. Then I get my output. So it's very simple to generate this output. But I just want you to now look at these two tabulations and you'll see that they both say spray rate, screen size, mill time, exhaust temperature, inlet temperature. But then I have on the left API particle size, on the right coating viscosity. And if you go to the very bottom, at the bottom here I have atomizer pressure, whereas over here I have the coating supplier. So you can see the results are not the same. In fact, let me just do this once more. I can just come to here and do a redo and redo analysis. And I'll get a third set of results. In fact, let me just put them here to make it easier to compare. So now what you'll see is that the, um, well, there's not, not so much difference at the top level. I just want to show you that even the top ones can change. Let me just do this one more time and see if I can get a bigger difference for you. And uh, no, so we're getting pretty consistently the exhaust temperature and inlet temperature, API particle size. Here we've got a sugar supplier. So we're only really seeing slight differences uh, towards the, the, the low effects, but sometimes you will see uh, a, a difference even towards the higher effects. Not so much with the which are the top five or something, but the order might change slightly. In fact, you can see it here. So I missed that. We've got spray rate and then screen size, whereas here we've got spray rate and then mill time. So the ordering is, is subtly different. But notice, actually, if you look at mill time and screen size, although the order has flipped, you can see actually the magnitude of these in both instances. If you just look at the bar chart, you'll see that those are in a equivalent size for both. The reason we get slightly different results is that because there is a process of 
sampling variation which is occurring here. And you might think that is a problem. Well, it's a problem. It's, it, it certainly causes a problem in terms of um, communicating the results of this. But that sampling variation is an integral part of how these calculations are performed. Put it another way, if you got rid of that sampling variation, you wouldn't be able to do these calculations in the first place. So actually that sampling variation is the trick for this algorithm to work. And so I want to explain that to you in more detail. And the way I'm going to try and explain it is by stepping back and looking at another way of answering the question to determine the predictive variables. And to do that, I'm going to build a decision tree. So I can do that using the partition platform. Okay, so for my decision tree, the outcome is my response. And again, I select the potential X's. So this is showing me that across all of the data, uh, just under 16% of the batches fell. Now let me perform a split. And it's showing that if I have a screen size of five, I'm more likely to have failures. And if I split again, if I have a screen size of five with a meal time less than 11, there's a very high chance of failure. Let me just do one more split. And now it introduces on the left-hand side of the tree where we didn't really have a problem if we had screen size of three or four. However, if we have a high spray rate, we do start seeing a problem. And let's maybe just take one more split. And this introduces another, well, I was going to say a process parameter, actually it's information about raw materials. So the supplier for magnesium stearate is coming into this decision tree. Now, one of the things I can do with this decision tree is ask, well, first of all, you can see that it's telling me if I just want to identify four parameters, I've got the screen size, the meal time, the spray rate and magnesium stearate supplier. So I've identified four. So I could say those are the top four parameters. You can go a step further and you can ask the question, what is the relative contribution of those parameters to this model? We can always in statistics think in terms of uh, sums of squares of variation and so forth. So let's just come and ask the question, what are the contributions? And I'll just hide the trees to make it easier to read this. And you'll see we have an output similar to the output that we saw with the predictor screening platform. I have a list of these contributions. I've got this visual representation, this bar chart, and it's sort of telling me that I've got three large effects, the, the meal time, the screen size, and the spray rate. And then I've got a smaller effect, which is the magnesium stearate supplier. Now how, let's come back to, uh, I'm going to prune this, I'm going to turn this off in a moment, so let's come back to the decision tree and prune this all the way back. And I want to think about how we're making the decision as to what to put into this decision tree in the first place. I have a set of candidates here, which are all of the potential parameters and associated them as a statistic. Um, we actually split based on the log worth. It's useful to come to here and sort by the log worth. So the one with the largest log worth is the screen size, and that's the reason we split on the screen size. However, if you look at the statistic for screen size and spray rate, they're very, very close. So you could imagine if we had a slightly different sample of data, maybe the spray rate would have been top of this list. So let's just imagine what would happen if I were to have a slightly different sample of data, and with that sample of data, we were to have split on the spray rate. Now let me split these data. So the top three look the same. We've got spray rate, screen size and meal time. Let's do one more split. But this time I have inlet temperature, whereas in the previous decision tree, we had the magnesium stearate supplier. So we have a different outcome. And if I look at the column contributions, of course, this is going to look different now. So the question would be, uh, which decision tree do we trust? Well, probably we're going to trust the first one because that's our data. But this is where uh, there's a bit of a bias. We've got a bias towards 
the sample of data that we happen to have. Statistics, to a large, large degree, is to try and help us protect against that sampling variation and that sampling bias. And there's a trick that we can do. Well, what we can we can sort of we can mimic the the sampling variation by not the trick that I've shown you here, which was forcing a split on a different variable. But I'm actually going to come back to the raw data, and I'm going to say, let's imagine instead of having 88 rows. So bear in mind, I don't have a lot of data here in the first instance. I'm going to take a subset, and I'm just going to take 95 percent of these data. That gives me 83 rows, so I'm just dropping out five data points at random. Now let's look at the outcome of that when I build a decision tree. So I'm trying to just illustrate here the effect of sampling variation by building a new sample based on a subset of the data. So here's my decision tree. Let's do a split. And we're splitting on the screen size again and then mill time. But now we get magnesium stearate supplier come in, whereas previously we had the spray rate. And let's do one other split. And now we've got the uh, another level of splitting on the screen size. And let's do one more split. And we've got the exhaust temperature. So let's now do column contributions on this. And let's hide the tree just to make it easier for you to see. So we have the screen size as the largest effect, and then we're kind of stepping down meal time, exhaust temperature, magnesium stearate supplier, and we don't even see the spray rate in this decision tree. Now, this was a sample of data. Let me redo this again. Um, in fact, I'm not going to go through each step. I'm just going to say, let's, let's create four samples. Each sample is going to be 95% of the data. And let's look at the column contributions. I've already gone through that process. This is what those column contributions look like for four random samples. Now, bear in mind that these samples contain almost all of the data. We've just dropped five data points from each sample, and we've done that in a random way. The first thing to notice is that there's a lot of similarity between these results. And that's not surprising because most of the data are the same but we are seeing sampling variation and there are some substantial differences. And I'm going to just point out one. If you look at the results at the bottom left, screen size is the most important parameter. Whereas the results at the bottom right, screen size doesn't even appear. So based on one set of data, we conclude screen size is the most important thing to look at based on another set of results, screen size doesn't appear and we'd focus our attention on the spray rate. Now, again, if I come back and say, well, which of these should I use? Well, my preference is probably still to use the original decision tree because that's my real data. And in a sense, this is, I'm not using all of the data here, but to protect against sampling bias and sampling variation, the preferred way would be to take all of these and average them together. And so we've got four decision trees and we want to build some sort of average. In fact, we can go a step further and say, well, what, we don't have to stop at four. We can take a hundred trees and those hundred trees we describe as a forest. And the, the, uh, if you have Jump Pro, you can build what's called a bootstrap forest. Now, you don't have to have Jump Pro to take advantage of building forests. So let's go back now and just remind ourselves how we set up the predictor screening platform. From the analyze menu, I can come to the screening option and choose predictor screening. Now I just specify my response and the list of X's and that completes the specification. But if you notice at the bottom left, we have the number of trees. So we're creating 100 trees. This is the forest that we're creating. And each tree is based on a random sample of data. Now, when I demonstrated, the, tried to illustrate how this works, I created subsets to create the, the random uh, sets of data. This is a bootstrap forest technique. And so we're using bootstrap sampling. And that technically is not a, a subset 
uh, but it is a, a random sample of the data and I'm not going to go into the details of what bootstrapping is or how it works. Um, but we basically have 100 trees, each based on a random sample of data. And here are my results. If I rank these high, medium and low, then I would say spray rate is high, screen size and meal time are medium, and then for low we've got inlet temperature, and then we have basically values going from low down to negligible. OK, but we still have random sampling in here. So if I just pop this to the left slightly and just redo, you will see a difference in the results. I think if I just look at the order here, I'm not seeing any major changes. We see some changes towards the bottom. So on the left, the bottom one is compressor. On the right, it's blend speed. So that's enough to show you there are some differences. Um, sometimes you'll see a flipping of the order. If I were to redo this a few times, I would be able to find a situation where maybe meal time and screen size flip their order. And that's because to a large extent, these, these magnitudes are very similar to each other. And similarly, if we look at at these effects here, exhaust temperature, sugar temperature and particle size and force, those magnitudes are very close to each other. So if we look over here, we've got, um, well, we had inlet temperature and exhaust temperature, uh, exhaust temperature and inlet temperature. So they're flipped order, but they haven't, we're not really changing our conclusion. But this might cause a problem if you generate some results and you want to present those results and they look different. That can be confusing for an audience or confusing for your report. So you may want to make sure you always get the same results. And to do that, you have to use the same collection of random numbers. The way we do that is through the dialog for the platform, you specify a random seed. So the random seed is the generator for random numbers. And by default, it's using a random random seed, typically based on the time of day. But if we put in a specific number, and you can put any number you like, now I get a specific set of results based on data, random numbers generated based on that seed. And if I were to redo this, I get identical results, absolutely identical. If you just look at the portion for spray rate, it's 0.2568, so 25.68%, if you like, and it's exactly the same number on both the left and the right. So that's the way you can assure you get consistent and predictable outcomes when you're using this platform. I think in some ways, I mean, that's, that has its place, but in some ways you're hiding the fact that there is this random element which is essential for the platform to work. So another approach is to come back to the platform and not use a fixed seed, but just increase the number of trees. I'm going to boost this all the way up to 5,000 trees. That's taken longer to generate, and this will obviously depend on the volume of data that you have. Let me just close these and just focus on this result here. Let me redo this. And now I'm going to get a separate uh, set of results because this is based on a, a different collection of random samples. But you should see, if I compare the two, that the differences between these two sets of results now are negligible. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please let me know by giving it a like. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.